welcome to Alaska Weather, a production of Alaska Public Media and the National Weather Service, Alaska Region. Produced and broadcast daily from the studios of KAKM, Alaska Weather provides complete forecasts, public, marine, and aviation for all of Alaska. Alaska Weather is made possible by the following sponsors. Indie Alaska is a groundbreaking series that dives into the lives of people living in the last frontier. Each episode introduces you to colorful characters from around the state. Funding for Indie Alaska is provided in part by Alieska Pipeline Service Company. Catch the latest episodes at alaskapublic.org. The National Weather Service. Hello again, everyone, and thanks so much for joining us for this Sunday's edition of Alaska Weather. I'm Dave Percy. On the satellite imagery yesterday, out here over the Northwest Pacific, we had low pressure uh, near Shimia, dropping southeastward, and then another area of development right in here, and it looked like those two areas were going to merge, uh, and this would energize the development down here with some colder air. And that's just what happened today, and that's developed into a pretty good storm that'll be bearing down on the Alaska Peninsula and the uh, Kodiak Island area tomorrow. You can see the uh, outer cloud shield with that system. Otherwise, we had another front move on to the southeast coast with rain all the way back here into south central Alaska, and this portion of the front drifting northward while this area moves northeast across the uh, southeast coast there. Back edge right up along the coastline now, so conditions will become more showery later on. Uh, low pressure out over the southeast Bering Sea, continuing showers, mostly along the coast and offshore there, back toward the Pribilofs, and then some moisture up here over the north and northwest interior. That associated with uh, some snow that fell from the northern Koyukuk Valley all the way out to Kotzebue Sound and to a lesser extent, much lesser extent across the Seward Peninsula there, but uh, some moisture slipping on down into the St. Lawrence Island area where they had uh, northerly winds uh, gusting up to 35 miles an hour at Gamble. And then this low with the showers again, mostly activity off the coast there, had some Partial clearing over the uh, Kuskokwim Delta today, as well as Kodiak Island uh, clearing out a little bit there. Definitely a dry day, but rain again here over south central Alaska with that moisture spreading westward with the low center, about 995 millibars, and then the front right up along the coastline, keeping it wet and windy in areas uh, along the panhandle there. In fact, uh, Clarence Strait had gale warnings out today, as did the North Gulf Coast uh, with uh, small craft advisories for the remainder of the coastline. Up along the Arctic coast, winds diminished from what they were yesterday and actually still gusting up to about 40 miles an hour in the east side there this morning, but those came down this afternoon. Just some areas of uh, flurries and patchy fog there with uh, light snow up over the west central north slope areas and just some scattered showers with light wind conditions here out over the Aleutians in across the Fox Islands and Alaska Peninsula, kind of the calm before the storm there. And we'll see uh, tonight the low center just making its way onto the chart with uh, this low still just south of Nunavak Island, keeping a chance of showers along the southwest coast into the Kilburk Mountain areas. And then snow with this Arctic boundary here continues from the eastern Arctic coast. Areas of light snow again across the northern Koyukuk Valley right out into Kotzebue Sound and maybe the northern Seward Peninsula areas, otherwise mixed rain and snow showers for St. Lawrence Island. Scattered showers and northerly breezes there for the uh, Aleutians. And uh, rain changing to showers, the first front moving through, another trough bringing showers in, but definitely uh, diminishing rainfall rates here across the southeast coast tonight and mostly in showers or precipitation, mostly in the form of showers or a more showery nature to the precipitation for the North Gulf Coast, Prince William Sound, in uh, across Northern Cook Inlet, uh, up in the Alaska Range, uh, kind of a mixture of rain and snow, depending on your elevation, back into the Kuskokwim Valley areas. But drying out here, again, uh, the dry weather over Kodiak Island, shifting northward up into Southern Cook Inlet. So it should be a pretty nice uh, overnight period here for the uh, Seldovia Homer area, also into Kamishak Bay with uh, pretty light wind conditions 
in that uh, area. And back out here to the west, you can see the next system that will push eastward and bring some uh, rain and small craft advisory winds, 25, maybe 30 knots into the western Aleutians. Otherwise, uh, still some scattered, isolated showers over the eastern Aleutians back up toward the Pribilofs, this ever-present low here just west-southwest of Nunavak Island, keeping a chance of some scattered showers along the southwest coast on up into St. Lawrence Island, but uh, nothing amounting to very much at all. Uh, the big system here coming northward, gale warnings and rain for the Alaska Peninsula tomorrow morning, northeast 40 knots there on the Pacific side of the peninsula. And then during the afternoon hours, uh, looks like gale force winds increasing to 40 knots here for Kodiak Island with rain spreading northward. It should be a pretty good day over south central Alaska, just uh, partly to mostly cloudy skies and mostly cloudy with patchy fog in the morning with most of the shower activity having ended and pretty good here over the southwest interior and just some scattered showers now, Prince William Sound and the north Gulf Coast and it really dries out across the panhandle, a uh, ridge of high pressure in over the area definitely drying it out over the southern and central areas, but some lingering showers up to the north, Juneau, Haines, on up to Skagway uh, in those areas, but again, uh, nothing too terribly heavy or persistent. And then uh, south of the front, some rain and snow as uh, actually that moisture is shifting northward from today's system that's made landfall on the coast, kind of intermixes with that stationary or nearly stationary Arctic boundary right through here. So south of the front, rain and snow, north side a narrow band of light snow, areas of light snow for the eastern Arctic coast, eastern north slope down, possibly into the Brooks Range, pretty dry with its frontal system back out to the west, still some snow shower possibilities along the northwest coastal areas, but uh, we'll see on <clears throat> excuse me, on Tuesday, this front pushes eastward and so looking at 40 knots, southeasterly winds increasing along this panhandle, definitely rain spreading in across the area. So another wet day on Tuesday after the break tomorrow and uh, rain back along the North Gulf Coast with uh, gale force winds as well with the rainfall uh, cutting off right around Prince William Sound. So could be a partly sunny day here for South Central Alaska, more so up over the uh, southern interior into the Tanana Valley. Still some areas of light snow, mostly over the upper Yukon Valley from the White Mountains northward to the Brooks Range. And then this system pretty dry back to the west. Not a real strong frontal boundary there, but enough to keep some precipitation going here up over the northeast areas. Not bad along the Arctic coast there. And uh, trough back across the uh, Bristol Bay area on up into the northern Bering Sea. Pretty good chance of showers, but again, most of that activity will be off the coast there. So pretty dry for the Yukon Kuskokwim Delta right up into the Seward Peninsula area. Could see some clearing there, Golovin and Nome in the afternoon. And then that frontal system out here to the west really elongates out and weakens into a trough here. Pretty brisk westerly winds across the Aleutians with uh, periods of rain or showers there from mostly west of Nikolsky across Adak and Atka on out toward uh, Attu. And for temperatures this afternoon, for the southeast coast, mostly in the lower to mid 50s, 54 at uh, Klawak, one of the warmer locations. Juneau had 50 degrees, 49 in Yakutat, and lower to mid 40s here across the Kenai Peninsula. Cook Inlet in the Susitna Valley, mid 30s in the Copper River Basin at Gulcana. Kind of a contrast here, just 29 this afternoon at Northway, but uh, mid 40s, lower to mid 40s there for Bethel and Delta. And then back down uh, a little cooler there at Fort Yukon with 30, about the same at Bettles, light snow throughout the day there. And uh, lower 30s back out to the west, 34 at Buckland, 29 at Kivalina and mostly in the mid to upper 20s up along the Arctic coast. Otherwise, uh, 39 at Bethel, 37 at McGrath, and a 45 degree reading out at uh, Bethel. That 39 was Nome. Bethel had 45, lower 40s for the Perbloff Islands and 40s for the Aleutians, as well as the Alaska Peninsula right up into Bristol Bay. But Kodiak with a little sun had 52. Lows tonight, 40s for the Panhandle, Kodiak Island, upper 30s here, Southern Alaska, uh, near 30, for the Tanana Valley, otherwise teens and 20s up to the north. Highs for tomorrow, 20s here across the Arctic coast, north slope into the Brooks Range, south of the mountains, 30s, and then 40s here south of the Alaska Range uh, to near 50 over south central Alaska and Prince William Sound. A day much like today, temperature wise across the southeast coast, but notably drier, 40s out to the west. Flying weather, uh, 
IFR to start with, or again with that area of persistent showers up over the northern areas there. So could see some IFR extending back into the coast range. Otherwise, improving conditions, VFR developing over the southern and central southeast coast. Area IFR spreading northward again kind of coming up across Kodiak Island throughout the day and afternoon hours. And then a swath of IFR up here over the northeast interior. Just some areas of marginal VFR back out to the west. Marginal VFR here along the southwest coast covering much of the Bering Sea. And then that next uh, system bringing more IFR into the far western Aleutians and Bering. Passes uh, Anatovic marginal VFR, same forecast for Adigan. Lake Clark and Merrill marginal becoming VFR tomorrow. Rainy starting out marginal, becoming VFR as well, with windy looking marginal at times, especially on the southern entrance. And for Isabel, marginal VFR, but Mentasta optimistically uh, looking for a VFR day through that pass. And Tanita, VFR as well. Portage starting out marginal, possible IFR to start the day out there on the eastern entrance, but uh, both entrances and through the pass should become VFR uh, by midday tomorrow. Chilkoot and White. IFR. Freezing levels uh, about four to 6,000 feet here over the southeast coast and 2,000 feet uh, up to St. Lawrence Island back down to the Aleutians kind of really undulating here 4,000 feet up along the North Gulf Coast. And for the uh, icing threats again with that uh, storm coming northward look for it mostly above 7,000 feet pushing northward onto Kodiak Island across the Alaska Peninsula possibly in the southern Bristol Bay and uh, some light icing possibilities out here over the southwest coast of Nunavik Island and some more icing with that front pushing into the western Aleutians. Looking at uh, winds aloft, uh, general trough out here over the Bering Sea and the Aleutians with the main jet to the south there taking a turn to the northeast and splitting right in this area the weaker branch coming in from the southeast across uh, the Kenai Peninsula in the southwest interior. Some upper ridging up here to the north and then southwesterlies at about 120 knots cutting in across the Queen Charlotte's and the southern southeast coast. 9,000 foot winds uh, showing not too bad here for tomorrow. Again, higher pressure southeasterly winds, uh, especially in the afternoon, but only at about 10 to 20 knots there along the southeast coast. Uh, much stronger band of winds here ahead of that front as it comes northward, 50 knots right into Kodiak Island. East northeasterlies at 45. Southeasterlies 15 knots over the southwest interior and the wind's still a little brisk on the Arctic coast there at 9,000 about 30 knots. Northwesterlies up to 25 and then southerlies up to 25 farther to the west on the other side of the ridge axis. And at 3,000 feet again those winds increase way out west there as that front approaches. Looking at pretty strong winds here with that front coming northward. 35 knots into the Barren Islands tomorrow afternoon, 50 knots say across Sitkanak, and then easterlies 25 to 30 knots across Bristol Bay. Southeasterlies 15 there around Unalakleet to 25 knots near St. Mary's with uh, east northeasterlies 30 knots on the western Arctic coast, but much lighter here over the northeast interior. And winds becoming southeast in the afternoon, but only at about 15 for the panhandle. Turbulence wise, smooth for the southeast coast. Could see some uh, light to isolated moderate chop below 5,000 feet up over the northwest interior in the Brooks Range area. But moderate turbulence coming northward across Kodiak Island, definitely along the Alaska Peninsula again uh, by morning there and then by afternoon for Kodiak Island. And after the break, I'll be back with the marine forecasts. The sky, majestic, vast, and ever-changing, but not as crowded as some would have us believe. To be sure, there are airplanes here. The United States has some of the most crowded airspace in the world. But if all of the 250,000 airplanes in the country were aloft at the same time, at the same altitude over the state of Texas, each would have more than a square mile of airspace all its own. So it's not surprising that aerial collisions are rare, but when they do occur, they're usually disastrous and always bad for aviation. That's why every pilot needs to know and practice the art of collision avoidance.
See and avoid. That's what the experts say is the key to collision avoidance. See and avoid. It sounds easy, but it can be a challenge. Weather conditions, the airplane, even our own physical state can all compromise our ability to spot other aircraft. So how do you turn looking into seeing? Well, you can get help looking for traffic from people on the ground or from people inside the airplane. Hi, I'm Storm Field, and we're here at Essex County Airport in Caldwell, New Jersey. It's a pretty busy airport, so I know how crowded the skies can be. General aviation has made impressive strides in safety in recent years, but reducing the number of collisions remains frustratingly elusive. There's a lot you and I as pilots can do to reduce the risk of collision, and that's what I'd like to talk to you about today. Collisions have figured prominently in aviation history. Aviation's worst accidents have resulted from collisions on the ground and in the air. The air traffic control system can trace its roots to such an accident. In 1956, a DC-7 and Lockheed Constellation collided over the Grand Canyon. The calls for greater air safety that followed the accident led to the establishment of what is now the modern air traffic control system. The probable cause of that accident, as determined by the NTSB, the pilots did not see each other in time to avoid the collision. The NTSB cited possible contributing factors, including visual limitations of the cockpit, preoccupation with normal cockpit duties, attention on non-piloting related activities, and physiological limits to human vision. These same factors are behind almost every collision today. Thanks in part to airspace regulation and collision avoidance technology, collisions involving air carrier aircraft are extremely rare. Unfortunately, ground collisions have occurred with substantial loss of life, and collisions involving general aviation aircraft, though infrequent, may be catastrophic when they occur. If a general aviation aircraft were involved in a collision with an air carrier, it could create tremendous pressure for regulations that could restrict access and increase costs regardless of what the circumstances were or who was at fault. So all general aviation pilots have an extra responsibility to avoid collisions. The rules for aerial collision avoidance in VFR weather are spelled out in FAR 9167. When weather conditions permit, regardless of whether an operation is conducted under instrument flight rules or visual flight rules, vigilance shall be maintained by each person operating an aircraft so as to see and avoid other aircraft. See and avoid. But how do you make sure you accomplish this task? Pilots have several tools. The most important is vision, knowing what to look for and how to look for it. Understanding the limitations of human vision is also critical. Knowledge of collision avoidance strategies and tactics is also important. And knowing where and when collisions are most likely to occur can help you to stay alert in high-risk situations. Most mid-air collisions occur in daylight and in VFR conditions, the times of best visibility. They can also be correlated to traffic levels, most occurring between 10 a.m. and 5 p.m. on weekends during the warmer months. In other words, times when the most traffic is in the air. Most occur within five miles of a non-towered airport. They are rarely head-on, instead typically involving two aircraft going in the same general direction. The closing speed at which they collide is usually relatively slow. Most involve a faster aircraft overtaking and hitting a slower moving airplane. And in more than a third of collisions, a flight instructor was aboard one of the aircraft. Instructors spend lots of time operating near airports, the most hazardous environment for collisions, and their attention is often diverted. If they're conducting instrument flight training, the student may be wearing a hood or foggles, resulting in one less pair of eyes for scanning and possibly restricting the instructor's view. But what does a potential threat look like? And how do you increase your chances of seeing it? You wouldn't fly an airplane before you knew how to use the instruments. The same principle applies to using your primary see and avoid instruments, your eyes. 80% of the information we absorb in everyday life is obtained through our eyes. But using this input to see and avoid other aircraft 
that is to develop a good scanning technique, requires knowing how vision works and understanding its limitations. Light entering the eye falls on the retina, which is like the film in a camera. But unlike film, only one part of the retina, the fovea, actually sees the sharpest image. The fovea is really only a very small part of the retina, comprising just one degree of horizontal and vertical vision. Now, to give you an example of just how small this is, this area of best visual acuity is only the size of a quarter when you use one eye and look only four and a half feet away. Anything outside this area cannot be seen in detail. In fact, the area just 10 degrees outside of your foveal vision is only 10% as clear as that of your central field of vision. At a distance of 5,000 feet, the foveal field is roughly a 500 foot square, and you should easily be able to see traffic within that square. But if the same traffic is just outside your foveal field, you won't be able to see it until it's 500 feet away. Focus is essential to vision. Okay. In order to spot an aircraft at a distance, the eyes have to be focused for distant vision. But there's a problem. Unless your eyes have something distant to focus on, they will relax to an intermediate focal point, somewhere just a little in front of the propeller. Without something to look at, the eyes lose focus in anywhere from 60 to 80 seconds. This is called empty field myopia, and it can render everything outside the aircraft, including conflicting traffic, virtually invisible. To counteract this tendency, you need to periodically focus on the furthest point within sight a cloud on the horizon, or a distant point on the ground. This refocusing needs to be part of a pilot scan technique. However, in times of poor visibility, in haze, over water, or with an obscured horizon, when a scan needs to be the sharpest, there could be nothing to focus on. In such conditions, the problem can be overcome by focusing on the farthest point visible. The wingtip will do. In times of poor visibility, this form of refocusing should be repeated every minute or so as part of your scan. The eye itself can have its capabilities reduced by environmental and physical factors. Irritants in the air, fatigue, age, residual alcohol in the bloodstream, lower oxygen levels, all can impact the eye. Welcome back. Well, light winds here out of the south for the south coast and then Westerlies at about 15 knots for the north coast. Northwesterlies at 15 for uh, Clarence Strait. Pretty light here through the central inside waters. Lynn Canal, south winds 20 knots with four foot seas. And then on Tuesday, big increase with that front coming across the Gulf of Alaska. Southeast increasing to 40 knots here all along the coastline. Even in the afternoon, southeast gales uh, develop here for Clarence Strait. Small craft advisories for Stevens Passage and uh, due to falling pressures to the south, a light north breeze there for northern Lynn Canal. And for the uh, north Gulf Coast tomorrow, southeast at about 20, 10 knots southeasterlies, Prince William Sound. Cook Inlet northeast, 10 to 15 knots, and then those east winds increasing to 40 knots here for Kodiak Island in the afternoon, and Shillikoff Strait northeasterlies increasing to 35 knots. And then for uh, Tuesday, the uh, gales diminish here down to about 30 knots out of the east, but we've got 40 knot easterlies here uh, for the north Gulf Coast, right down into the Barren Islands, northeast 40 knots for Kamishak Bay, on down toward uh, or on down across Shillikoff Strait, and northeast uh, 35 knots for Southern Cook Inlet, while Northern Cook Inlet looking at small craft advisories. And for Bristol Bay tomorrow, easterlies at 20 knots, but the big increase in the winds will be down here east and northeasterlies from Sitkanak all the way to Cape Sarachev at 40 knots with uh, seas as high as 17 feet and small craft advisories here in the Bering Sea side of the peninsula. And then on Tuesday, uh, winds become northwest 20 to 30 knots here across the Alaska Peninsula, northeast 25 for Bristol Bay with six foot seas. Northeast 25 with 15 foot seas there southwest of Kodiak Island. And for the eastern Aleutians tomorrow, northwest winds 25 knots with 7 foot seas. Adak and Atka, westerlies at about 15 knots, pretty light winds, and then uh, small craft advisories here ahead of that next front entering the far western zone. And uh, again, westerlies 30 knots here. 
from uh, Shimia right on down south of Adak and Atka, kind of a low center right in this area somewhere. So easterlies north of the islands there and continue uh, small craft advisories for northwesterlies 25 to 30 knots for the Fox Islands. And for the southwest coast, southeast winds 15 to 20 knots tomorrow, northeast 25 for St. Lawrence Island, northwest 15 for the Perbolofs, and uh, even lighter winds in store for St. Paul and St. George on Tuesday, northeast 15 to 20 for the southwest coast, St. Lawrence Island, easterlies uh, down to 20 knots with four foot seas. Eastern Arctic coast, gale warnings out, northeasterlies, heavy freezing spray from uh, Cape Thompson to Cape Beaufort, small craft advisories for the western Arctic coast and north to northeast, 20 knots for the central and eastern areas. And then for Tuesday, winds really drop off here from Wales to Cape Thompson uh, through this area just east of 15, still pretty brisk here along the western Arctic coast, small craft advisories, easterlies at 30, easterlies at 20 on the uh, east side. And for tonight, again, rain changes to showers. Another trough keeping it kind of showery, especially up along the North Gulf Coast into South Central Alaska, but rainfall diminishing and uh, some snow continuing up here across upper Koyukuk Valley back out toward Kotzebue Sound. Chance of showers on the Southwest Coast. And then the next big storm coming northward uh, tomorrow morning, gales and rain into the Alaska Peninsula. They'll overtake Kodiak Island, especially during the afternoon hours while showers decrease here from the North Gulf Coast. Pretty dry day for much of the Panhandle, especially in the south. And then most of precipitation up here over the northeast interior with just some uh, scattered showers or flurries back to the west. And then that system pushes gales into the south. These forecasts are to be used for planning purposes only. Call 1-800-WX-BRIEF for a formal pre-flight briefing. Always file a flight plan before you go flying. The U.S. Coast Guard Auxiliary urges you to leave a float plan with a friend or the harbor master before you go boating. Alaska weather is made possible by the following sponsors. The National Weather Service.